All right, hey everyone, welcome to today's webinar. Um, just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, my name is James Grant. I am the Customer Success Manager here at iMeasureU. For those of you who don't know what iMeasureU is, it's a lower limb load monitoring system to help improve your return to play protocols. Um, just some bits to know about how the webinar is gonna work. On the bottom of your screen, you'll, you should see a Q&A portion. So if you have any questions throughout the webinar, uh, go ahead, enter, enter them in there, and we'll have a question and answer portion at the end with Tor. Um, you will be sent the recording after the uh, recording is processed, so keep an eye on your email for that. Uh, and then at the end, we do provide a link for you to play around with the IMU step um, data, uh, so you'll be redirected to that after the webinar. So a bit of a background on Tor. Tor Bazir is a professor at the Auckland Bioengineering Institute and has a joint appointment with the Department of Engineering Science. He completed his PhD in musculoskeletal biomechanics at the University of Western Australia in 2000 and was a postdoctoral fellow in the bioengineering department at Stanford uh, from 2003 to 2006. While he was there, he uh, established Stanford's Human Performance Laboratory as the director of research and was a faculty member in the Department of Orthopedics at Stanford from 2006 to 2010 uh, before returning home to New Zealand where he is now in 2011. Uh, in, in 2014, he co-founded I Measure You along with uh, Mark Finch. Uh, and currently, Tor's research combines medical imaging with computational modeling to understand the mechanisms of musculoskeletal injury and disease. Uh, he's published more than 100 scientific articles on uh, those subjects. So. Um, I'll ha without further ado, I'll hand it over to Tor uh, and let him take it away. Great, thank you, James. Lovely to be here, kia ora, everyone. And uh, as you can probably see, it's a little bit darker here in New Zealand. It's still uh, very early in the morning, but I've had my cup of coffee and I'm ready to go. And just like to thank you, James, for inviting me to do this webinar and thank everyone else for, for joining in. And I hope there's a little bit of interesting information in it uh, for everyone who's watching. What I thought I'd do today is uh, cover a, a, a few different areas. Uh, first of all, just uh, before we get into it for full disclosure, um, as James has already said, I was a co-founder of iMeasureU and I remain actively involved in the company. There are, there are kind of three parts to my talk and I kind of apologize to some perhaps if this seems a little bit like a, a lecture of sorts. And um, the first part of this talk will go into a bit of detail about bone mechanobiology. And I really think that's important to set the scene here because the other elements of understanding injury and particularly bone stress or fatigue type of injuries it's really critical to have that background and understanding. So we'll spend a little bit of time talking about mechanobiology of bone, what is it, and how does it influence uh, uh, the risk of injury. And then we'll spend some time specifically on bone stress or fatigue injuries uh, before we talk about a bit of a case study with IMU STEP and optimizing recovery. So, We'll start off then with this background of bone mechanobiology. And here, really, I, I love this quote from Dennis Carter, which was one of the more fundamental papers that was done on the mechanical loading and load history of bone. And so I just take a little bit of time to, to reiterate this. So he states the elaborate and mechanically efficient designs that exist in all animal skeletons on an ultrastructural, microstructural, and to some extent, the organ system level are not directly a result of natural selection. And some of Dennis's work really started to explore the nature nurture debate about how important were the, um, is the DNA versus the, the mechanical loads on influencing the skeleton. And he goes on to say, rather they are to a great extent, the end products of the algorithms by which mechanical energy influences growth and form. And so from here on in, this really sets the scene for some of the work that's gone on, particularly in the area of bone, in the field of, of biomechanics and here mechanobiology, to really understand how do the mechanical forces regulate the tissues of the body with um, specific interest to the musculoskeletal system. So 
here we have a scan, a CT scan of a femur, and this is an image courtesy of the Melbourne Femur Collection in Victoria, Australia. And the two parts of the bone that we are interested in are both the spongy or trabecular bone, sometimes called cancellus. Uh, the compact cortical bone is around the outside, the dense bone that you see here, typically down the shaft uh, of, of the femur. And if you look in finer detail and, and kind of zoom into this, the trabecular structure as Wolf kind of predicted uh, hundreds of years ago was aligned somehow to the mechanical stresses of the, of the bone. So the stress alignment then can potentially alter the distribution and shape of these trabeculae struts that, are, that, that make up that, that spongy bone. And if you look at the cortical bone, it has this uh, very dense arrangement of cellular network and the cells within bone are called osteocytes. And we can see them as these little, little dark points here. Uh, and these round circular structures that you see here in, in, this, in this dense cortical bone is called an osteon. And it's at this level that we see a changes going on uh, when the bone is loaded and we see that the, the cells within this network, these osteocytes, these are the mechanically sensitive cells that then trigger changes to, to bone. So to, to go any further here, we really need to have some kind of understanding of the processes involved in both establishing new bone, but also then in changing this bone or, or, or remodeling. So those are the real um, processes that, that, that we'll discuss. But it's also interesting to have a quick look at a cross section of this bone. So this, these are mid shaft cross sections of the femur. And here we can see then the difference between the bone across a group of similarly aged individuals. These, these are again from the Melbourne Femur Collection. So these individuals are between 78 and 80 years of age, so similar in age, but you see a vast difference in the quality of the bone. So across the top, you're seeing men, and at the bottom, you see women. On the left-hand side, you see some nice dense uh, thickness here of the, of the cortical bone, nice and thick. As you progressively go to the right-hand side, you see thinning of that cortical bone. You also see the porosity changes, so the density of that bone changes, and we know uh, down the bottom right here that women are potentially more susceptible to some of these changes as they become potentially osteoporotic. So this is really poor quality bone where you're seeing much more, more holes and, and porosity present. So it really begs the question of these individuals, you know, they're the same age, but why is it that we see such a large variability in this cortical bone, both in the density and, and the structure? And this is really where we need to understand these two processes that are going on. And these two processes are bone modeling and bone remodeling. So they kind of sound the same. Uh, what do we mean and, and what's the difference between them? Well, bone modeling is the formation of new bone. And this is the formation of bone that we see during growth and development. And of course, this happens around epiphyseal plates. So we have a diagram here showing the cartilage that's part of the epiphyseal plate, as well as the cartilage that's at the surface of the joint. The difference then with remodeling, remodeling is the adaptation and regulation of the existing bone. And you can think of this as the shape changes that can go on with the bone. Now these shape changes can occur during the growing skeleton, but they can also occur during the adult skeleton when, when our bone is matured. So, both of these processes are regulated by mechanical loading. And we know this to be true, we've known this for some time. There has been a, a lot of work, particularly on bone, to try and understand how these processes actually work and um, the mechanophysiology by which these processes work. And it's worth us kind of diving a little bit deeper too to understand how bone actually remodels because it's gonna help us later on when we try and understand how do we recover from a bone fatigue injury? So here we have the two parts of the bone that we've mentioned already. So we've got this trabecular bone in, in the blue kind of here, 
And these trabecular bone have cells that kind of line the, um, the, the outside of those struts, those trabeculae. And during this process, we have activity from cells which kind of resorb the bone. These are osteoclasts. And then there's a new bone that's laid down, which is called an osteoblast. And this, uh, this process then is a continual process around the struts. And as I said before, these struts can kind of align themselves to the mechanical loads or the loading history, essentially, that you see in the bone. And here we have the cortical bone. Now, this is a little bit different. The way this remodels is through what's called a cutting cone. And this is kind of a, a diagram of, of this in process. And we have the same type of cells. So the osteoclasts are kind of burrowing away in, inside the bone here. And then they're followed by the osteoblasts that are laying down new bone. And so this cutting cone is nicely seen in this SEM image here. It's a, a relief image of, of bone at very high resolution. And you can see this nice formation here of, uh, of this uh, basic multicellular unit, this, this cutting cone here. Now this process, if you're thinking about how long this takes, it takes around 200 days for the cutting cone to then be fully, um, fully matured, so that's actually cutting through and laying down new bone. So within 200 days, this, uh, this process can occur. It's a little bit less in trabecular bone, about 150 days. And what that means is that after a period of around two years, the total surface of that trabecular bone is remodeled. So you can imagine there's some sort of load history across time, which then dictates the, the structure of both the trabecular bone as well as the cortical bone. And so this is where it gets a little interesting as well, because we start to then unravel how bone actually changes and the mechanics that are involved in that. And we typically think of these bone cells, these are the osteocytes as the ones that are sensing the changes in the mechanical environment. And they respond mostly to strain, so deformations and also micro damage. So it, it's also a, a, a bit of a hot topic still in that the biological and mechanotransductive pathways that underlie this mechanism is still unclear. So there's still a little bit that we don't know. There's some, some really interesting work that shows that these cells, these osteocytes, like most cells in the body, have a primary cilia, and that cilia sticks out, and it's kind of mechanically sensitive. Uh, it can respond to fluid flow. So in the case of cortical bone, where you can't you don't expect a lot of strain, you're not expecting the bone to change a lot. These primary cilia can sense changes in, in the fluid that's in within the, the habitual canals within the bone. Uh, and there's also a lot of work looking at the integrins and the parts of the cell that attach the cell bodies to the underlying structure and, and they can be mechanically sensitive as well. So this is kind of an area still of, of exploration. But nonetheless, we're quite comfortable with the idea that mechanical loads influence the bone. And indeed, uh, Harold Frost, uh, for over 20 years now, has you know, kind of established this idea of what he referred to as a mechanostat. So this is just like a thermostat, something that regulates uh, temperature. But in this case, this is some sort of regulation of bone. And the regulation here is just basically saying, that along the x-axis we have some sort of cumulative stimulus and we know the stimulus to be some sort of strain so some sort of tension or change and deformation of, of those cells uh, of the bone and the response here is to change and the change in bone that we see has initially been identified as a change in mass but more recently uh, the, the term strength is kind of uh, being used here. And I'll get to this in a little bit in terms of why we use strength maybe instead of, uh, instead of mass. But essentially to orient you to what's going on here, we have so, some sort of stimulus along this x-axis. Now down the bottom we also have some thresholds that identify the different stages of uh, modeling or micro damage that might occur 
um, in, in the bone. So we have this area, sometimes it's referred to a lazy zone, where it says the bone receives some sort of load and it's quite happy. It's not going to add uh, any additional bone and it's not going to resorb bone. And it's important to identify that, you know, it costs energy for the body to maintain bone. All of those little cutting cones and, and osteocytes, osteoblast activity, uh, cost, cost energy to the body. So the, the body really wants to stay somewhat in a bit of homeostasis. If you supply too much load, a, let's call it a supra-physiological load, a load that the, the bone is not really used to seeing, you can indicate sit then and see some change in adaptation of the bone. And this is where we can see some uh, remodeling occur. Uh, we have maybe a threshold of micro damage after which you see an increase in the bone that's laid down. And likewise, if you go the other direction and you reduce the stimulus to the bone, and the classic studies that have, have shown this are, are bed rest studies, uh, it's well known, of course, in astronauts who experience zero gravity, that without load, you get a rapid deterioration in the strength of the bone. So the mass goes down, the porosity can increase, and, and you get re reduction in strength. And indeed, actually, uh, this is far more um, deleterious to, to the body than going up this end of the curve, which uh, we know there's kind of a break here that the bone can withstand thousands upon thousands of loads before it gets to ultimate failure or fracture over here. So this is kind of interesting from the standpoint of it's giving us the foundation knowledge of, of how bone is laid down and how bone is adapted to its mechanical environment. So one question that kind of arose here is uh, from this work is, can we understand what kind of stimulus really is applied to bone to predict changes in the density of the bone. So for this, I'm going to refer to some work from Rob Whalen that he did with Dennis Carter back in, in the 1980s. And some people um, may be aware of this work and, and it became known as a, a daily load stimulus, which has been used by ourselves in the I New Step kind of philosophy of, of what we're trying to do to understand bone injury and cumulative loads. But the other thing just of note, you might be wondering why I've got this picture of this kind of funky looking treadmill down here. Well, this is one of the first real prototypes of the Alter-G treadmill. So Rob Whalen was working for NASA at the time and he designed this treadmill that had a hard case around it. And the idea is that you could take that into zero gravity. You could take that into space. You could depressurize this chamber and it would suck you down onto the ground and simulate, if you like, some type of uh, gravitational load that you, that you get here on Earth. And it was Rob's son, actually, Sean, who kind of liked the idea because, you know, this was kind of set up in his garage at the time and said, well, why don't we do the opposite and uh, try and pressurize the chamber and push someone off the ground so that can, they can run it at, uh, at zero gravity. And that was the, the birth of Alter-G, of course, which is the, uh, the interesting treadmill. Uh, we'll, we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail as well. That was just kind of a little side note. But uh, what's going on with this daily load stimulus here? And the idea is that we know that bone responds to these cumulative loading events, the load history, what's going on during every day, the bone experiences all different types of loads. And we, we also recognize that the bone responds to the magnitude of each loading event. And indeed, it responds more to the magnitude than it does the total number of cycles. And so in this equation here, I'll just walk you through what's going on. We have two key terms here. N is the number of cycles that you might expect throughout the day. And the stress term here is the type of load that's experienced by the bone. So this, this could be ultimately the strain that's placed on that tissue. What's uh, really 
important here is to understand that there's an exponent here. There's this term, this M thing. Now this term says that the stress here that's applied to the bone is actually more important than the number of cycles. And so what Rob Whalen actually did here with the study is he tried to predict with some basic knowledge and understanding of, of the loads on the skeleton, he tried to predict what kind of influence different activity levels would have on the density of bone. And he was looking particularly at the calcaneus here, so the heel bone, and he was looking at different activity levels from someone who is very active to someone who is an, uh, perhaps uh, a, a sedentary person. And it turns out that this exponent uh, is, uh, fits experimental data really well if it's between say two and four. So what that means, uh, the stress is to the power of two or four uh, times more important than the number of cycles. And this is actually, the form of this equation is actually very similar to the form of models that look at fatigue damage. So a life cycle of damage that accumulates in tissues and it's been shown to, to fit experimental data to biological tissues rather well. And so this kind of makes sense then that this form uh, as, as a daily load stimulus is a reasonable, reasonably good characterization of the changes in adaptation that occur in bone, because we know those changes in adaptation are related to the micro damage that, that occurs in the bone. So uh, those of you who are uh, astute in the audience might note that I've been kind of interchanging a few terms here in terms of the, the changes and adaptations that occur in terms of density, mass, and strength. And so it's important really to understand, you know, what actually determines the strength of bone. And the strength of bone is, is a, a little bit uh, complex here because it's a combination of all of these things. So if you think of strength as being the resistance to being either squashed, we call this compression, or being pulled, this is tension, or a resistance to bending and twisting, so we'll call that torsion, then bone mass is important, but where the bone is located is actually more important. And so what I mean here, if we go back to our example, is the cross-sectional area of the bone and the thickness of the cortex, because this dictates how much resistance there will be to say these bending moments, which are really important for our long bones, our, our load-bearing bones, which undergo large bending, bending forces. And then the, when we're thinking about dense bone, we're thinking there's more mass. So clearly on this side here, we've got a bone that has more mass than this osteoporotic bone, which has lots of holes in it. And so the, this diagram nicely kind of represents the, the size and, and shape bone has. So here we've got some examples of, uh, let's say, these bone structures. Uh, this structure here is, is solid. It has, let's say, a mass of one. Uh, same mass over here, but now we've actually got a kind of a hollow structure. And so the diameter is increased of this structure. And over here, we've got a, a larger diameter uh, again, and, and we've doubled the mass. So what's going on here when you look at the strength, the tensile and compressive strength, so that's if you just push or pull on these different structures, you can see that with the same mass, you need the same force essentially to either squash the bone or, or pull it apart. When we double the mass, we need um, two times the force or, or the strength of this bone is doubled. But when you look at the bending and torsional strength, for the same mass, you have more than two times the resistance to bending and torsion. And look what happens here when now we increase the mass, but we also increase the diameter, you get a four and a half fold increase in its strength. So this is really important. The, the, the shape of the bone and of course the, the thickness of the cortex plays a role here in, in maintaining the mass or density of of that bone as well. And it turns out during growth and development, uh, before the skeleton is mature, this is where we see the biggest changes in the diameter of our long bones. So this is really important public health message for our children because they really need to be physically active 
during growth and development. So they experience a, a large magnitude of load to encourage that bone to, to grow in size because these types of size changes stay with us for the rest of our lives. Okay, so what are the most important mechanical loads that cause bone remodeling? Because there's been a little bit of debate in the literature, I guess, around this idea that the, the, the muscle forces are, are critically important compared to the loads that you experience, which we call kind of gravitational loads, which are just you know, the loads against gravity, if you like. And it turns out that that, that is definitely the case. The muscle forces dominate the type of contact forces you get at, at joints. They dominate loading uh, applied directly to the skeleton as well. And of course, we know that the muscle forces in utero, so still while we're um, a growing infant inside the womb, uh, those muscle forces are, are critically important to the development and, and growth of, of our bones. But what's also really important to note is that the bending moments, when, once we start walking and standing up, the moments that are applied with bending, coupled with those muscle forces, are really uh, a, a very strong. And those bending moments are really what cause the compressive and tensile and torsional forces that you see in the center of the long bones, which is why the shaft of the long bones has a very thick cortex uh, and is made predominantly of cortical bone. Now, I just want to uh, highlight some results from a study, a recent study from uh, Joe Hamill uh, and, and his team who have looked at trabecular bone in the calcaneus of runners. And although it's a, a, a little bit tricky to see here, I can kind of zoom in on this. What we're seeing is a relationship of the thickness of the trabecular in the calcaneus in relation, this is a cohort of runners, and you can see as the uh, running distance increases of this cohort. We can see these people uh, over here typically perform more running than people over here. There's some sort of positive relationship, which you might you know, find that's not so surprising. The, the runners that do more running have slightly uh, more dense bone than, than these do. Uh, and what's kind of also interesting to note is that these group of people up here are forefoot strikers, and these people down here are rear foot strikers. Now, it could, um, it could be that their forefoot strike is actually leading to greater stresses in the calcaneus due to the muscle forces and the tension in the Achilles tendon. But uh, there's a confounding factor here, right? Because these people are also running, running, running further. The other interesting thing they showed is the relationship between that trabecular thickness and the number of years spent running. And again, there's a somewhat of a positive relationship here, which you might expect. The longer period of time you've spent running, the more opportunity there's, there's been to lay down a uh, new bone and for the trabecular to be thicker. And the last thing which I find, of course, very interesting here is the age at onset of running. So at what age did you actually start running? And here we see there's a slight negative relationship, meaning if you started running much earlier in your life, so between the ages of say, you know, 12 and 20, there's a much greater chance that you have thicker trabecular, as opposed to someone in their mid 30s. And sorry if there's a few people out there in the audience who are in their 30s and decide to be marathon runners, but your trabecular thickness is, is unlikely to be well adapted to that activity. So there's kind of an interesting study there that's kind of highlighting uh, the, the strains and, and the effect they have on the, the structure of the bone. Okay, so I've spent a good deal of time talking about mechanobiology of bone. I hope that was interesting because it kind of sets the scene for the next section, which is bone stress injuries. And so here, what do I mean by bone stress injury? Well, this was a really nice review paper and I implore you to read it. Uh, Stu Warden with Irene Davis and Mike Fredrickson did this nice review in 2014 and indicated bone stress injury represents the inability of bone to withstand repetitive loading, which results in structural fatigue and localized bone pain and tenderness. Fatigue is the word really of interest here. And so I, I often refer to these type of injuries rather than bone stress injuries, I talk about fatigue injuries because that's the mechanism by which the damage has occurred in the bone and by which we get 
uh, obviously these negative outcomes. So what, it, what is a mechanical pathway for fatigue injury or fatigue damage? And ultimately, we know that there's some cumulative stress that leads to damage in the bone. So a, a continued stress to the bone, and if that bone is not remodeled or doesn't have time to remodel, that continued stress then leads to some microstructural damage, so microfractures, which could then lead, uh, if the stress continues, it could lead to macroscale uh, fractures. It gets a little bit hairy here because we need to understand the, the stress and strains of neck tissue and the total number of cycles if we really want to understand cumulative uh, stress or cumulative strain. Now this gets really challenging because as I've said, there's lots of factors that go into the strength of the bone and what kind of forces are being applied to the bone. So the morphology, the material properties or density, the, uh, the reaction forces, these are kind of the gravitational loads, as well as the muscle forces go into how the, the, the bone experiences load. So this gets really challenging. And you're sitting there going, holy, you know, how do I measure all this stuff, right? I, I'm just working with my athletes day to day. Uh, I don't have an ability to, to measure this. So how is it measured? Well, this is some, some pioneering work from Dave Burr uh, in, in the 90s, and he teamed up with a, a researcher called Milgram who pioneered this method, and this is a staple that gets um, implanted into your bone. So if you're lucky enough to be enrolled in this study, you get a staple that gets banged directly into the cortex of your tibia. Uh, and it, embedded in the staple are some strain gauges. So as the staple bends, it moves these little gauges and you can measure the electrical uh, potential change as those gauges move. So this is a, a standard type of strain gauge to measure force, but the difference is that this is implanted directly into the bone. So that's really interesting because it then gives us a direct understanding of that localized strain that occurs in that, um, in that area of the bone. And so you can see these, um, these strains and you can see both compressive and tensile strains during activities like walking, jogging, running and sprinting. And so that one part of the bone undergoes a cycle of loading that goes both compression and tension. So it changes from one to one to the other. And you can see some of the values here of, of strain. Now these are measured in microstrain. So it's not as if the, the, the bone's bending a great deal. These are um, a more microscopic uh, strains or changes in, in deformation. So that's all well and good, uh, but holy, you know, um, I'm not gonna do that either. So that really doesn't help you if you're a clinician or a a research scientist or, or even just a coach wanting to understand what's going on with your athletes. So there's other ways of estimating bone strain and this is what we would typically do in the research environment. We would measure the bejesus out of someone when they come into the lab. We take uh, estimates of the muscle activity which is EMG. Uh, of course we're using inertial sensing uh, as well now but we would do traditional motion capture where we put markers on people, we track the motion, we measure reaction forces at the ground. These are the ground reaction forces here. Then we have a, a very complicated modeling pathway that takes us through understanding the kinematics, understanding the dynamics, and then estimating muscle forces to then predict what the strains are using perhaps a finite element model. And again, you're going, well, holy, I'm not going to do that either, right? None of this is within the realms of, of possibility out in the real world. This is really just for us researchers in kind of clinical environments. Okay, so this leads us on to some surrogate measures. What can I do in the real world? And this is where things like um, these miniaturized sensors have really made an impact and, and will continue to make a difference in the field. And the idea here is that we're getting a reasonable surrogate measure of the loads on the tibia. Obviously, we're not directly measuring the strain, but tibial mounted accelerometry has been shown to be a quick and effective measurement. It's reliable, it's sensitive to things like changes in technique, changes in fatigue, and changes in different running conditions that we know change 
the strain in the bone. And we know that because Milgram and others have actually directly measured those strains in the bone. The challenge here is to understand what that relationship is. Uh, for running kind of dynamic impact activities, uh, it turns out this is a reasonably good surrogate that uh, can see as you generally increase your running speed, you get increases in the, in the peak tibial accelerations, and these also correlate with increases in, in bone strain. For other activities such as, say, squats and deadlifts, where your feet are firmly planted on the ground, you can imagine that the accelerations you measure during a deadlift don't quite uh, uh, estimate the fact that you're lifting 100 kilos, for, uh, for example. So the bone strains that you might estimate then uh, would not be representative of the, the accelerations that you measure at the tibia. Now we've done some work, this is work from Kelly Sheeran, who's at uh, Auckland University of Technology, uh, um, at the other university here in Auckland. And Kelly's done some work on a cohort of runners uh, and this has been done by, by many other groups as well, particularly uh, Irene Davis and, and her group, looking at the variation in tibial accelerations that you get with runners. And at baseline, we can see here, Kelly had a cohort and he took this cohort through and measured tibial acceleration. You see a, a really wide range in the peak tibial acceleration. So that's measured in Gs here. So an extraordinary range, really, considering that these people are all running at the same speed. And we kind of, um, we, we've probably all, all seen this, those of us who have worked in the field of, in measuring accelerations, the, the changes in technique, changes in footwear, uh, cha changes whether you're, for example, maybe running on a treadmill or running on different, uh, different terrain can, can change the tibial accelerations that are experienced. And everybody here is different. Um, what Kelly's done is looked at repeatability week to week, and then he's done a study to show that if you give feedback, and he's using haptic feedback, so small vibrating motors, to say if you are experience high acceleration, can you change and adapt and, and reduce your acceleration? And so that work is, is now published, and Kelly's got a couple of other publications showing how you can actually change, if you get the real-time feedback, you can change your, your gait, your running behavior, your mechanics to actually reduce or mitigate some of these high impact uh, accelerations. So then we think, well, okay, that now that we can measure these tibial accelerations and let's assume that they are representative of the strains essentially that go into the bone, how do we then use this information? And we come back to the concept of a daily load stimulus. So now what we do is we have, and this is the same form that we had before, where we have the number of cycles, and that's nice. We can easily measure that with these accelerometers. We can count every step that you, that you take. And here, as our surrogate of stress, we can input then the peak tibial acceleration. And you'll notice also we have our little exponent here that says the importance of the magnitude of that load it far outweighs the importance of the number of cycles of load. So that's, that's really critical here to include that in, in this equation. So now we've got a framework where we can estimate mechanical fatigue in the real world. And this is really what we then have termed bone stimulus. We initially called it a, a bone load. There was uh, some, some visceral um, comments <laughs> regarding that in, in the literature and, and the um, the biomechanics colleagues of mine uh, got very upset at the idea that we called this bone load because they rightly pointed out this wasn't a direct measure of bone load. And indeed, it's, it's really more uh, an understanding, a surrogate measure of mechanical fatigue. So I'm just putting that out there for, for those of my colleagues who might be watching this presentation. And I accept it. We, we changed the name quickly to bone stimulus to better represent what it actually means and where it comes from. Okay, so that's uh, a bit about bone stimulus. What's uh, also uh, really interesting is the, the rest of the community is kind of understanding the importance of measuring fatigue in, in its mechanical sense as well. This is a really nice review article from Brent Edwards, who's at the HPL up in Calgary. And Brent has, really kind of outlines this idea of how we should be looking at these injuries from a mechanical fatigue perspective. And so what he's done is kind of outlined 
or outlined the approach that you choose and the idea is that you be able to measure and monitor the loads in the system. These loads are of course applied to the tissue of interest. This could be bone, this also could be muscle or it could be tendon. And you understand both the, the stress strain, so this is now the deformations and the normalized forces applied to the tissue, as well as the total cycles and duration. That then goes together and has some formulation for damage. And that total damage then is, that's applied to the tissue, uh, the question is, is this damage more than some critical value? That's what this DC is. If it's more than some critical value, you get injured. If it's not, if, if it's underneath some threshold, that might then lead to some sort of remodeling or adaptation in the bone or the, or the cartilage or the soft tissue. Um, and then you have some sort of change in the structure. Then after changing that structure, for that damage um, that's being applied, is that now putting us below this critical threshold um, this process then can continue until you're in equilibrium. And this is kind of where Frost would say, you're in a mechanostat lazy zone. You've reached equilibrium, the damage is no longer um, causing micro, or micro damage to, to the tissue. And of course, if we're interested in what happens if the damage goes above this critical threshold, that's when we get injured. Brent also has some really nice papers looking at uh, predicting fracture risk and he's using a slightly different method here with a, a probabilistic type approach but essentially what he's saying is in this paper it's kind of interesting what happens if you increase your running speed and you go from two and a half to four and a half meters per second and you might see uh, this is contact force that he's modeled uh, and you can see some increase in the contact force and what does that do to the bone strain if you apply that to a finite element model which he did you can estimate the peak strains that you can see both in compression and tension. Uh, and those strains increase as you go from two and a half to three and a half to four and a half meters per second. And that's kind of expected. And the other thing you could do is calculate the loading exposure. So this is taking into account the number of cycles uh, of this event. So this is an assumption that you run the same distance. Now what's going on here, of course, if, you run, if you're not running as fast, you might take more steps. So your total cycles per day here might be greater than if you're running at three and a half or four and a half meters per second. But what's interesting is your probability of failure then, because if you just take the number of cycles per day, you might come to the wrong conclusion that this is uh, putting yourself at more risk of damage compared to this. But when you look at the probabilities of failure, those probabilities are, uh, are shown here. And this is kind of a, a period of 100 days where we had this kind of model. What happens if you apply loads to, to the structure, to the bone in this case? And what is the probability of failure of that structure? And after a period of time, you see this plateau. And for people who are used to seeing I'm you step, you, you're used to seeing this plateau. This effect, and, and there's no surprise here because what we're modeling is, is fatigue and, and the potential for fatigue damage. And it's, a, it's good that it plateaus because if it didn't plateau and just was linear, it just meant no matter um, what you did, you would get fatigue damage and you would get ultimate failure of that bone if you just kept running. But we know that bone is a material that if you stay within this uh, this fairly broad band of this lazy bone uh, or lazy uh, band, you can withstand this repetitive cyclic loading for a long period of time. But what's important to note here is if you run faster, you get greater strains and the strains are the dominant thing here that lead to the probability of failure. And so that's why you see up here a greater percentage. So if you think of this as a percentage, this might be a 25% uh, probability of failure as opposed down here to say a 9% probability of failure. And you can see those here as well. Okay, so interesting take home message from this one if you're dealing with athletes is that the speeds and the mileage um, relative here, um, it turns out that the speeds are more important because the speeds are changing the loading magnitude 
uh, rather than the total load exposure or the total number of cycles. And so you should be running at lower speeds to reduce that magnitude if you want to reduce the probability of failure. And that's, of course, what clinicians invariably do with someone who has a fatigue fracture. They reduce the, the, the loading. And that's uh, obviously an effective strategy um, to begin with. So we're doing some work as well, also with Irene Davis and Mary Buchstein, who's a bone biologist at Harvard, where we're following a cohort of basketballers to try and validate some of these approaches. We're using some fancy imaging methods. This is high-res PQCT, where we can look at the trabecular architecture and the bone density in high detail. And we're looking at metatarsal as well as the, the tibia and trying to see how do our models then uh, predict the, the, the bone health in these athletes? So stay tuned. We've got some more work coming out on, on that as well. I'm rapidly running out of time here, and uh, James is looking at his watch saying, Tor, are you going over? But um, I'll, I'll briefly touch on this, um, which is a, a case study that was done with IMU STEP, and then we'll open it up for questions because I'm sure a lot of people have questions. And... I really like this kind of quote at the end of, of Rob Whalen's paper, which said, in order to develop a successful exercise study, one must carefully quantify the daily load history. And what we learn also is if we really want to develop a successful rehab uh, we, and optimize rehab, we also need to carefully understand the daily load history. And we, the first thing we need to do, of course, is measure and quantify these loads. So this is a case study that was, uh, has been published by iMeasureU, and it was work that Dean Golich did with Holly Lawrence. And Holly is a, a world champion Ironman athlete. She suffered a navicular fracture of her right foot. It was um, then fixated, so it was a, a macroscopic failure that required a, a screw. She went for uh, a run, actually a competition afterwards, and actually fractured again. She still managed to finish the, uh, the, the, the competition, though, finish the race. Uh, but the question is now what? And so Dean was faced with this. Dean started working with her uh, after she, um, or, or sorry, before she had surgery. So the idea is how do we bring her back to high-performance sport, knowing that she's had this, this um, horrible uh, fracture? Now, the, at the time, they had an Alter-G treadmill. And so the cool thing about the Alter-G treadmill is you can dial in a change in, in the offloading, if you like, uh, and say, I want to run at 80% of my body weight. So you can dial this in. Uh, the treadmill pushes you off the ground, and you can run at reduced gravitational loading. What's actually really important here, though, is that the accelerations and the impact that you receive on the ground are not necessarily linearly related to what you dial in on the Alter-G. And Dean found this out pretty quickly and he recognized that running speed had a great, much greater influence on bone strain. And this goes back to what Gwen Edwards was also showing that the running speed is a really important factor here in the probability of, of, of failure of the tissue. So Alter-G is, is a, a fantastic tool. You can mitigate the some of the loads you can maintain metabolic uh, cost of locomotion which is really good uh, but it's important to recognize that dialing up 80 percent of body weight does not necessarily lead to 80 percent reduction in, in the impact loads and the strains that are going to be experienced by the bone so this is kind of lesson number one if you like um, for, from this case study so what dean did he he took a a, a graded approach as anyone would do with an athlete who's suffered a fracture. But the, the really interesting anecdotes that we take when we, when we speak with Dean about how this occurred and how he used IMU STEP was that, you know, he, he came up with a statement and said, look, if I could wave a magic wand, I'd go back in time and get a, this baseline information on this athlete so he could understand for every speed or the distance or different types of terrain, he would have a snapshot of or a profile of what the bone load would look like and what the individual symmetry and and impacts would look like on each limb and of course this is the great thing that you can do now you can wear these sensors over a, an entire session and you can gather this information and that's what uh, many of you maybe in, in the audience are doing right now and here you can see in this first session 
straight away you can see symmetry changes as you would expect. So Holly has a damage, um, a fracture in her right foot. So you can see the impact loads that she's experiencing in her right foot are far less than a left foot. The, the, you see this also in the, in the bone stimulus. So again, this is the stimulus or the mechanical fatigue uh, variable that we have within INU step. And you can see a discrepancy here. Note also the shape of this. So it's again mimicking that idea of probability of fracture. You kind of reach this plateau and then it, um, and then it stays fairly stable. And of course, this is again weighting the magnitude of load uh, more than the number of cycles. And so uh, Dean then progressed Holly through uh, a running regime where he, he had slowly introduced load and she would come back with um, good rest in between. Rest is important. It's also interesting. So the group from Indiana uh, University uh, as uh, Roebling and colleagues had some really nice papers some time ago showing that uh, if you have intermittent rest, in between your activity, you can actually stimulate those osteocytes more than if you had continued exercise. So this is really, really useful for uh, an athlete who's recovering from injury to say, you, you can do shorter bursts of activity and receive a heightened stimulus to, to the bone. So that's a really interesting take home message here that you don't necessarily need to be doing longer and longer workouts. You could be doing more intense workouts over short periods of time, and you would get to the same bone stimulus. And so what we're seeing here is a progression. So now 4th of September, uh, a couple of weeks, this is uh, the session number eight, we're already seeing uh, some sort of equilibrium in terms of bone stimulus to the, the right side of the foot, and we're starting to see more of this pattern emerging. What's also interesting about these is you can characterize the distribution in those impact loads and on the left side, which is not injured, you see a far more uniform pattern of, of, uh, of impact loading. And as you continue then to progress, um, you see these, these patterns uh, emerging where you have more uniform uh, loading between the left and right limbs. And again, you see some discrepancy here between left and right limb. And Dean was also noticing that uh, as Holly would say, get tired, she might revert back potentially to, uh, to offloading that limb. This is where real-time feedback becomes really useful. So if you can monitor and measure these loads in real time, you can give this feedback to your athlete uh, as they're actually exercising, which is, which is a really interesting paradigm. So what does this look like over the season? And I'm just gonna quickly wrap up here. And over a season, you can, you can look at say medium and high impact sessions. So these are all of the sessions across uh, a period of, of several months where Holly is returning to her normal activity. And if we look just at the medium type uh, of, of activity through the sessions, we can see some rest periods in between. There was a longer rest period here. Um, but the idea is that you're slowly uh, alternating between your more medium type of activity with your higher activity. And if you just look at the higher impact activity alone, you'll see a graded increase here. And this is what Dean is doing. He's bringing her back to the more higher intensity that's, that she is used to experiencing. So these equate essentially to faster running speed. So she's getting back to her race pace, doing more intense workouts. And um, you'll notice also some, some significant gaps. So the, the, these are rest periods. Uh, the key thing here is that Dean is working with Holly and trying to get her feedback about what um, she feels like as well. You, you've obviously got to take that into consideration. Was this a hard workout for her? Is she feeling some pain? And use that as an indicator of have I received enough of a stimulus? Because there is unfortunately no magic number when you're looking at the values here. There is no magic number that says absolutely if you get to this bone stimulus, you've had enough. Um, it's really dependent on the status of your bone, the quality or the strength of your bone, how much load and load history that bone has, has undergone. So um, I'm, I'm going to close it out here with this other um, quote. Again, this is from Stu Warden, uh, Irene and, and Davis and Mike Fredrickson paper, which says, you know, the micro damage accumulation and subsequent risk for developing these bone stress injuries is related both to the load that's applied to the bone 
and the ability of the bone to resist that load. So that's the strength of the bone. And of course, the former is more amenable to intervention. So the loads applied to the bone is more amenable to interventions and can be modified in terms of training design and the, the program that you put with your athletes. So this is really then the space that we're occupying with IMU STEP. It's providing you with a tool to better manage your athletes and, and the loads that they experience. So I'm gonna close it up there. Um, I'm gonna thank you for your attention. Uh, just noting also that Holly returned to racing early in 2019, uh, several months after Dean first started working with her. And the good news was that she won her first race back from injury. And that's, thus far as, as far as I know, she's still running injury free. So thanks for your attention. And I guess we're gonna cut some uh, questions, James. Yep, thanks Tor, great presentation. Um, for those of you that do have questions, a reminder that you have the Q&A button on the bottom of the screen, so you can type in questions there. Um, so Tor, the first question is, um, I noticed that there's no um, section for weight in the daily load stimulus equation. Does the weight of the athlete um, contribute to the load stimulus in any way? So the weight is taken into account for the, by, by the accelerations that you experience. Now, if you had the luxury of doing this computational modeling, you would, uh, you would measure reaction forces at the ground, you would measure the joint moments, you would estimate muscle forces, and then ultimately the strain on the bone, and the strain would be your stimulus. And so that would be a, a really, uh, that would take into account the, the body weight. And so if you're just dealing with the acceleration component alone, you might appreciate that you can have a very slight runner and a very heavy runner. They might experience the same accelerations, uh, but you may not experience the same, exactly the same bone strain. And so th this becomes a challenge. And in, in using this measurement, what we really want to do is not compare one athlete with another. That's not what the intention is. The intention is to use this to compare that same athlete over a period of time. And so if that athlete changed their body mass in a dramatic way, yes, that would, you know, the same accelerations might result in, in different bone strain, um, but we're not taking that into account. So it's really uh, using it on, on that one athlete and understanding how that athlete changes, changes over time. So I hope that addresses that question. Okay, great. Um, so I have another question from Jeremy here. He says, practically at the moment, we only measure cumulative stresses during a subset of training sessions. This may give us, give us a good idea of the stimulus for remodeling, but is it enough to understand the remodeling process? Or in other words, how do we incorporate the subject specific rate of repair into our daily load stimulus estimates and then the damage probabilities? Wow, it's uh, a loaded question here, but uh, if I can kind of pull that apart a bit, you know, I, ideally we measure everything we do in, in, in all aspects of life. We, if we have 24 hour monitoring, because you know, the bone is, is adapting to all of the stimulus that it, that it experiences. Now, the, the, good, the good news for us is that we know that the bone responds much more to the magnitude of load than the number of cycles. So knowing that someone stands around on, on their feet uh, all day or sits on the couch is probably less important than capturing those intense exercise sessions that have really large strains on the bone. And that's really then why we're using the tool mostly to capture these training sessions and not saying, hey, look, you should measure everything on, on, on your athlete. And so that, that gets probably to the first question of, you know, what's important to measure in terms of the bone stimulus, though, whenever you have these high impact or, or events, high loading events, you want to kind of capture those because those are the events that are really important for applying load to the bone. And in terms of then understanding the, the remodeling, this is really more of an art than a science right now, unfortunately, because it's very difficult to capture the status of tissue health. And that's, that would really be required if you were to say, I'm, I've now applied the stimulus and I'm, I'm happy with the, the rate of progression or, or the remodeling that's occurred 
such that I can now up my, up my stimulus and increase the intensity of my session. And so this is where you really have to work closely with the athlete and it's a one-on-one -on -one tool where you're saying, look, I've, um, I'm gathering this information. There's qualitative assessments that you do with the athlete as well to see how they're, how they're feeling. You know, was it an intense session or not? Maybe you have to have these rest periods. But, you know, the, the important thing in this is understanding that, that there is this lazy zone as well and that bone doesn't need to receive a huge number of cycles for it to be happy and healthy. And that kind of makes sense as well. If you think about this from, um, from a, a long-term um, perspective of, of how the bone is maintained and what we need to do to maintain that bone, because it costs us energy to maintain bone. And so um, in, within that lazy zone, it's quite broad. So any amount of activity is enough for the bone to, to really be happy and, and stay in this homeostasis. You, you have to push it quite hard to get above that limit. Now, of course, the case of where you already have microfracture and damage means that you, the load that you could sustain previously is now reduced. So you do have to, of course, manage that to let the healing process come back to, to increase then the strength of the bone. And the bone will respond in a positive manner. Of course, that's it's how it's designed, it's regulated to do that. But it's, it's almost as important to capture your rest periods as well when you're dealing with your athlete and, and looking at rehabilitation and making sure they're getting the adequate rest in between, in between those sessions. Uh, I hope I touched on at least a few important parts of that, of that question. I think so. Um, all right, so next question would be um, medial tibial stress syndrome is also a kind of stress fracture. Um, how would you manage such, uh, uh, such injuries, surgery or conservative? And could you use some examples um, with yeah, steps? So, so, you know, this, this, um, this really forms a continuum. And this is also how Mike Fredrickson explains it in, in that paper as well, where they're looking at fatigue injury. and so at one end of the spectrum, you have what is commonly called a stress reaction. So these are the first signs that there's been some damage. Now, these, these signs might be symptoms. So I'm starting to get some pain or swelling. Sometimes it's not easy to see these on imaging. So MRI might display some uh, bone marrow kind of edema, some swelling. And we're, we're including some of those measurements now in our MBA study uh, to see if we can use MR as a more kind of diagnostic tool for seeing progress, uh, but it's really hard to kind of image that uh, and see changes. So you've got a stress reaction, and if you continue then to apply load, that stress reaction turns more into a, a, a stress fracture. Now, the, the term stress fracture, um, personally, I, I don't really like it so much because every fracture is due to stress from a mechanic standpoint. So I much prefer to use the term fatigue fracture because that's really the underlying mechanism by which the damage occurs. But um, so, you, so you have this kind of continuum from stress reaction to microscopic to macroscopic fatigue to, uh, and, then, and then full fracture, right? And so what you're doing is uh, with a stress reaction is no different than what you're doing with a fatigue fracture. It, it's the same process. It's just along a continuum. and so. You know, conservative, of course, is, is, uh, is the first thing uh, you should do in terms of... Uh, now, I'm, I'm not an MD, of course, um, so I'm kind of outside the, the realms of expertise here in terms of, uh, of dealing with, with athletes uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and prescribing and diagnosing, but um, I, I would be treating the stress reaction as the precursor, of course, to a, to a full fatigue fracture and then having conservative treatment. Rest, of course, is the first one, but the key thing in the end is a graded response and progression back to, uh, back to loading. This is where, and as an example of this then, this is where the bone load, uh, or the bone stimulus rather, a metric is kind of interesting for us because you can, uh, uh, you can achieve that bone stimulus in a variety of manners. You can achieve it by doing a, a a lower intensity for a large number of cycles 
or you can have a slightly higher intensity for a shorter period of cycles. And we know that you um, will, will, or the bone will respond to those higher incidences uh, much more than the lower ones. But of course, the challenge here is that you're dealing with bone that's suddenly damaged. So that damage threshold has now been reduced so that previously you could sustain these large loads, not a problem, now you can't. So that's why, you know, that the process then is, is one of a much more graded response. You're not asking your patients who have stress reactions to jump off tables and do, you know, uh, crazy, crazy type of activities that involve really large bone strains. You're asking them to do much more graded response. And the example of the Alter-G is a good one that, you know, by changing your running speed uh, and uh, Brent Edwards also has a nice paper on changing cadence. So for the same speed, you, if you increase your cadence, you reduce the magnitude of load. So even though you might take more steps, you'll get to the same bone load, but you're doing it in a slightly different manner. And that's a more conservative approach to, to bringing the athlete back. And that's essentially what Dean has done in the case with Holly and, and been quite successful. All right, thanks Thor. Um, so just as everyone knows, probably noticed we're going over time here. I'm gonna extend this out for probably another 10 minutes because we got some really good questions I wanna answer. Um, but just a reminder, if you do have to leave, we will send you the recording afterwards. Um, so with that, Tora, I'll ask the next, next question. Uh, this is from Thomas. He says, how well does the DLS match stress strain testing when only using acceleration as opposed to doing both accelerations and muscle forces? Uh, or in yes, simpler yeah. terms, how good of a measure do you get by substituting acceleration for strain in the DLS calculation? Yeah, so un under certain conditions, uh, it works rather well. And this has been shown with a number of different papers. And those conditions are uh, the ones that are kind of outlined in terms of running impact type sports. And so if you see an increase in running speed, you'll see an increase in the, the peak tibial acceleration. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's caveats there because if you do loads and squats uh, or deadlifts or something where the, the foot is anchored to the ground and it's not accelerating, the, the measurement you get from the accelerometer is, is in no way going to be representative of, of the loads or the strains that are experienced. So, you know, you have to take that kind of caveat in, into account when you're using this, this metric. But for most of us who are dealing with fatigue type injury athletes, these are the type of athletes that are runners, that are track athletes, uh, that are um, involved in repetitive running type activities and, and therefore it's, it's well designed and I think it's a reasonable surrogate. We're doing some other work as are others. There, there's plenty of other groups out there who are doing this type of work too where you, look, you use more kind of machine learning type approaches rather than let's say deterministic models and, and the idea there is if you kind of know your ground truth from a very complicated model you can then capture the data and, um, and create a surrogate model that's more a statistical representation of what's going on and do a fairly good job at predicting much closer to the to the strains but to get to actual bone strain it is a real challenge because you've got to take into account all of these different factors you need to know the, the bone morphology, its material properties. You need to estimate muscle forces. Estimating muscle forces is something that we've been doing for a long time and the biomechanics community has kind of, it's been one of the biggest challenges in biomechanics uh, uh, because we know that the muscle forces are so important, yet we don't have an easy way of measuring muscle forces. And that's why we, we really come back to some surrogates and the surrogate measures are the only things we can do reliably right now in the field. So, you know, there, there's, um, there's good reason to, to question it. And if you understand where it comes from and you understand the uh, conditions, the caveats that I, that I mentioned, then I think it's still a really useful tool for measuring and monitoring, let's say workload, um, and, and really what we're meaning here is trying to understand the strains on the bone in, in these type of athletes and scenarios. Great, thanks, Dor. Um, considering that the bone stimulus is a time-dependent bone modeling and remodeling approach, 
Is it valid to say that it might not be a good parameter to express joint contact overloading since it saturates relatively early during the day? And do you think the total impact load would be a metric that could better monitor bone overloading and long-term activities? And so let me see if I can understand that question properly because um, the, the time history, yes, absolutely. Now, now we're not taking, for example, into account the fact that you might have uh, really high bone strains initially in, in, a, in a session followed by very low bone strains and you, you might get to the same result if you go low to high or high to low. And um, the, ultimately the bone is going to respond to the summation of, of all of those mechanical loads. The time variance becomes really interesting when you're looking at the response of the cells. So the osteocytes that are sitting both on the, on the trabecular, but also sitting within the, within the cortical bone, because as, as Roebling and colleagues have shown from, from Indiana, that if you have intermittent stimulation of those cells, so, so you do an activity and stop, you get a heightened sensation of those, of those osteocytes. And so you get a heightened response. And as opposed to just applying loads continually over, over a period of time, because what happens is the cells kind of saturate, if you like. So the response of the cell gets to a point and says, oh, okay, I've received a stimulus, that's enough. And it doesn't matter that you receive that stimulus another 10,000 times. Um, the bone is, has said, I'm, I'm, I've received the stimulus. Thank you. I, I get the message, you know. And, and, and for this reason, it explains why a marathon runner doesn't have a bone mineral density that's 10 times my bone mineral density, even though a marathon runner, you know, does 10 times more mileage and 10 times more load exposure than, than my bone. Right? So that they, they might only have a modest increase in bone mineral density compared to my bone. They might also, importantly, if they've been a runner from, from the early ages, like say from 12 through to 18 years of age, if they were doing long, large mileage then, what you will see is that they have a, a greater cross-sectional area of the bone, which gives rise to much greater uh, resistance to torsion and bending loads and that will stay with them for the rest of their life and that will actually mitigate the type of strains they receive when they're doing these high impact or high loading type activities. Uh, James, I'm not sure, did I, did I answer all the questions there? Yeah, the second part of the question was, um, do you think the total impact load would be a metric that could um, monitor bone overloading in long-term activities? Uh, yeah, so, so we'd like to think so, and, and of course you, you do see the saturation that, it, that occurs, and this is the, no different than the probability of, of fracture that you see with, with some of the work, say, that Brent Edwards is, is, is showing, right, that after a period of time this kind of saturates, but, but it's important to characterize all, all of that loading over longer periods of time. Uh, because the bone ultimately responds to all the loads that it experiences. So, so capturing those uh, is important, obviously. We'll find out more, I guess, from, from our validation study with, with the basketballers that we're doing with, with Irene Davis and Mary Buchsein from Harvard, because we'll have, I guess, the best possible way to capture the bone health with high-risk PQCT uh, before and at the end of the season. And so we'll be able to see, you know, what kind of fidelity is needed to, to try and predict that. I should say there was another group and, and this group were from Finland and the, the first name of that um, researcher was Ahola. And that group actually showed that using the, the same bone stimulus, using accelerometer measures as a surrogate of, of, of strain, if you like, actually was predictive of the changes in bone mineral density and they used uh, they use DEXA scans and they might have used CT as well to, um, to show the, the results of an intervention, a, a high intensity kind of loading intervention on adults. So there's good reason to believe that that bone stimulus metric uh, plays out in terms of the, the prediction of bone health or changes in, in bone mineral density. 
Okay, we probably have time for one more. Um, so I'll ask this one. It's not a two parter. Uh, do you see any relevance of the load stimulus monitoring to soft tissue injuries in runners, for example, patellofemoral pain? Yeah, uh, great question. So, you know, th there's been relatively less done in the literature on, on the soft tissue, but there's no reason to believe really from, from what has been done that these tissues uh, are not really dissimilar to bone in the way that they model adapt and 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 kind of change to their mechanical environment the probably the big difference is the rate at which they do so so tendon we we know has has a very poor blood supply and it has a, a very uh, compared to bone slow rate of turnover and adaptation and so when you're using something like the the, the bone stimulus the idea is that that's, that comes from the literature of fatigue and, and uh, fatigue damage. And, you know, there's been work, Tisha Wren did a PhD with, with, with Gary Beaupre, again, it's um, the VA in Palo Alto with Dennis Carter and, the, and that group. And they, they showed nicely as well with their experiments that the Achilles tendon also has the same type of, um, can, and can be modeled with the same type of fatigue Brent Edwards goes into this. I, I would read his paper on this on, on mechanical fatigue and shows that there's, there's no reason to believe the soft tissues uh, are no different really than bone when it comes to this, this process. So having said that, the, the bone stimulus measurement, although we call it a bone stimulus, uh, might be a, a more generative kind of idea that, um, that it can apply to soft tissue as well. But for sure, less work has been done on that. We've, we're doing a little bit of work. Uh, colleagues at Griffith University in Australia have done some really nice work in capturing the the, uh, the the loads on the Achilles tendon and looking at that over a period of time and doing personalized modification of interventions and load interventions to, to actually uh, dial down the specific strain that they get in the tendon. So they use some pretty complicated modeling and we do some work with them on the finite element modeling to capture those strains, and then to find a window of strain in the Achilles tendon where you want to then do your activity. So uh, that's a very long way of saying, yes, I believe that, that the same type of uh, approach can apply to soft tissue. Okay, interesting. Um, so that's probably all the time we have now. Thank you for everyone who attended for your great questions. If we didn't get time to get to your questions, feel free to reach out. Um, and we can discuss offline. Uh, Tor, thank you for your time in the presentation. Um, and a reminder that you will be sent the webinar after the processing has been done, probably sometime around tomorrow. Um, so that concludes our webinar. Thanks everyone for attending and we'll see you all soon.